What is happening to our good old planet? Men seem to have lost their landmarks, their data, their connections, their images. We have become so used to the countless services satellites provide that without them the world would be a nightmare. Fortunately, bad dreams go away in the first light of dawn. And a new day begins on our planet under the close watch of these invisible birds constantly hovering over our daily lives. Nowadays it seems so easy to watch a television program, make a phone call, check the weather forecast, or draw money from a cash dispenser that we tend to forget the invisible work of satellites and the impressive array of applications they make possible. We may not be aware of it, but satellites have a constant influence over our lives. Strange flowers have grown up on our rooftops, pushing back the narrow borders of our village. Satellites have reduced the world to the size of a pocket handkerchief, making the antipodes close at hand. A multitude of diverse television platforms is now available, making it seem impossible that we once watched television on a single black and white channel. It all began in 1960. Nowadays the choice is vast. Television overrides borders and distance and has become a network for extraordinary cultural exchange. We're in Ertlsat's control center, also called the CSC. It works 24 hours a day, monitoring our entire fleet of satellites to ensure coordination of their power levels and use of frequencies. You can raise 2 dB. Across our fleet, we handle over 3,500 TV channels, which are broadcast simultaneously, and we respond every day to approximately 300 requests for occasional transmissions, for news gathering and data exchange. Thanks to geostationary satellites, images from hundreds, thousands of television channels leap into space and dive back down towards our homes in half a second. Huge progress has been made since 400 million people were able to watch the first live world broadcast in 1967. Today we're so used to watching sports events through live transmission that the amazing technology needed for these broadcasts seems almost trivial. It all happens as if the broadcast image dematerializes in that infinitely small moment during which it travels between the producer and the viewer. But after all, aren't television images part of our imagination? If you'd like to sort of go from ground zero to how the picture starts to how it gets to your TV at home, um, it's such a simple method to switch it on and say, well, that's a nice program, or I don't like it and switch it off, without understanding what actually happened before it got to your screen. And if you really think about it, it starts off with a thought in somebody's mind. Somebody had a great idea and they thought this will make an interesting story, and they've got to break it down into all its components that would gel together to make something interesting on TV. So now you've got to turn the words into pictures. And hopefully then everybody comes for a screening and the production managers who have commissioned this approve it and say it's fit for production. It gets then scheduled into the production schedule and on a great day, everybody sits around in their home or millions of people sit around in their home and switch on and your thought now becomes a million other people's thoughts through this whole process. The North-South divide is particularly wide when it comes to education. With the emergence of tele-education, satellites are helping to reduce that inequality. The idea was to train field agents for health, for education, to train teachers, to train specialized nurses and lab technicians, and later to train administrators to address the very strong demand in sub-Saharan countries. 
in other words, the need for middle managers and field agents. C'est-à-dire l'absence de, de cadres moyens ou d'agents de, de niveau terrain. Ouagadougou University and the Bamako Engineering School were the first in the program. From France, the CNES, the French National Space Agency, and Thales Elenia Space provide technicians, trained people, and equipment to the field. Teams from both foundations were doing the final antenna calibration while in Paris, the Georges Pompidou Hospital opened its doors to us. Professor Lebra was ready to test teleeducation through video conference with the first three courses for nurses, midwives, and lab technicians. From Paris to Johannesburg, the objective is the same, to break down the frontiers of education. Thanks to satellites, it's possible to connect teachers with students in the same virtual community. Welcome to Mindset Network. My name is John McBride. I'm the schooling content manager. That means that I'm involved in the process of developing video content material and providing resources to under-resourced schools and teachers uh, so that they can teach in key subjects like maths, maths literacy, science, IT, and even in terms of language development, English for first additional language teachers. These materials are packaged together and then broadcast via satellite to remote schools as well as local schools so that teachers and learners everywhere can get access to the latest information via satellite technology. In South Africa, more than a thousand schools are involved in receiving our content via satellite. Um, and in across Africa, there are over 800 multi-choice centers where they also receive our content. So Mindset makes the English curriculum that you guys see on TV. From there, it's sent to multi-choice to the dish at multi-choice for it to be able to send to space. Okay, from there, it's broadcast to the little satellite that you and I at home are able to watch. Communication satellites play an increasing role in tele-education for remote areas bringing connectivity where there's not enough developed school infrastructure to meet with the needs of the population. Although the extraordinary progress in communications made possible by the telephone, and especially mobile phones, owes more to underwater cables than to satellites for crossing oceans, satellites are an exceptionally efficient way to interconnect local transmitters in rural areas. And in the most isolated areas, or whenever a network is inoperable, satellites become the only way to keep you connected to the world. In the event of a natural disaster, this can save lives. Thanks to their flexibility and their great mobility, the use of satellite systems allows communications to be set up in a very short time, with very little ground equipment. In crisis situations, natural or other disasters, we can quickly restore immediate transmission installations for images, voice telephony and data exchange. Those requirements led to the creation in 1998 of the Telecom Sans Frontières Association, a French non-governmental organization specialized in emergency telecommunications. Telecom Sans Frontières sets up rapid mobile connections, helping humanitarian and United National agencies in the field to work more efficiently in crisis situations and survivors of a catastrophe to contact their relatives. As soon as a crisis occurs, we have the obligation to reach the field in less than 24 hours, anywhere on the planet. The first hours are crucial to save lives. In crisis situations, even when they are not destroyed, terrestrial networks get saturated. The only solution is to use a satellite network. It can enable a chief fireman or a city mayor to make an immediate estimate of a situation 
and rescue teams to coordinate in real time. In addition to emergency assistance, Telecom Sans Frontières works to combat digital exclusion, bringing to isolated populations the means to communicate with the rest of the world and receive economic information, medical care, education and weather forecasts. We've all heard of them, and they're a great help when we're driving. We're talking, of course, about navigation satellites. We might even go so far as to say that they've changed relations between men and women for the that better, way. preventing some of the domestic rows, which on so many occasions have spoiled the pleasure right. of weekend outings. Head into the wall, then. GPS guidance suddenly improves the comfort and serenity of the co-pilot. A number of applications have sprung from this technological breakthrough, including roadside assistance or this small portable device designed for assisting the visually impaired. These people have the same challenge every 200 meters. We realized we had to make a precise navigation device for city driving, with vocal assistance when needed. Good morning. I'm a bit lost. Can you help me? I see in your initial itinerary you wanted to go to the pharmacy and to the post office. I want to go to the post office. Where should I go? Telemedicine is another application supported by satellites. It facilitates knowledge sharing and brings medical care to isolated or displaced populations. The SAMU call center in Toulouse, France. This section specialized in assistance to ships at sea. Through video conferencing transmitted by satellite, a doctor can perform a medical checkup irrespective of a ship's location. How's the patient? Could I have a look to see how it's evolving? Could we have a look at his throat? Well, listen, it looks fine. I can see he's in remission and we can terminate his treatment. We hope we'll soon have video transmission and data transmission from any children's hospital in remote areas as easily as we have from a ship at sea. Before satellites, man had virtually to rely on watching birds to draw an uncertain weather forecast. Nowadays, with frequent weather bulletins available, a rain shower won't catch you unprepared. Weather forecasts have become a customary service, and we tend to forget the complex technology behind them, which depends on satellites for 90% of its data. For weather forecasts, we absolutely need observation. No observation, no weather forecast. That's the first fact. The second important premise is that satellite observation was a revolution for weather forecasts. When satellites appeared, the number of cyclones rose dramatically. Not because more cyclones occurred, but simply because we could detect those we couldn't see before because they occurred over oceans. Every day we use images from a geostationary satellite called Meteosat, which revolves with the Earth. We see Europe constantly in various ways. The first is black and white photography. It's just as if we were on board the satellite and constantly taking black and white pictures. White for the clouds and grey or black for land or sea. Another image we use every day is what we call infrared image. Orange and red means high temperatures, over 30 degrees Celsius. Generally that means land. Then you have black. You see the difference between land and the sea. The sea is much colder. With these two sorts of images, a weather forecast engineer knows what types of clouds are above a given area. For us, a satellite is a fantastic tool. It tells us exactly where the cyclone is. We can anticipate better and protect people. The first Earth observation satellite was American. It was called Tyrus and was launched in the 1960s. It brought us 
the image of the Earth taken from space. It gave us a whole new vision of our planet and made us realize how fragile and isolated it is, and so how important it is to us and how we have a responsibility for its future. The demographic explosion on our planet, combined with rapid industrialization, is a major factor in the acceleration of environmental problems. Destruction of natural resources, such as deforestation, carries immediate consequences for the population. Global warming is now a direct threat. In the early 1990s, the European Space Agency launched two observation satellites. They sent us a thousand photographs that showed tectonic activity, areas of industrial pollution, and of course, the hole in the ozone layer. Three. March the 1st, 2002, Kourou Space Center. Scientists hold their breath as they watch Ariane 5 rise majestically into the sky. It carries on board Envisat, the largest and most sophisticated satellite ever launched. Environmental research focuses primarily on the preservation of the planet, yet Envisat's technology has many other applications. Marine biology, hydrology, cartography, sea traffic control or atmospheric chemistry are some of the many and varied research areas benefiting from Envisat's extensive data collection. Satellites can work with several measurement techniques. We can observe surface temperatures or the color of the ocean. This gives us information on the amount of chlorophyll, hence the amount of plankton in the ocean. Another measurement is the height of the ocean's surface. Satellites help us to understand what is happening below the surface, variations in currents, in temperature and in salinity. We know that because of global warming, the ocean tends to rise, and this is a parameter we must watch closely to understand how global warming is evolving. We observe that the ocean rises approximately 3 millimeters every year. By studying the data provided by altimetric satellites, we can measure ocean surface currents. This information is extremely valuable for ships at sea. Using currents to travel, a transatlantic ship can spare 5 to 10 tons of fuel in one crossing. Tracking systems can locate ships, control their itinerary, and even measure their fishing intensity to ensure that they're not fishing beyond authorized waters. Radar satellite tracking systems make it possible to detect illegal fishing vessels and force them to leave protected areas. Ocean observation systems also enable precise monitoring of marine ecosystems and more efficient protection of species, especially during reproduction seasons. Scientists need to constantly improve their knowledge to protect endangered species. Satellites are extremely useful in this field. We tax the animals with transmitters with automatic systems of data recording. The main measurement is temperature. There's a temperature sensor inside, which gives us the temperature of the water where the animal is. The other main measurement is a pressure sensor. By recording the pressure over the animal, we can measure the depth at which it is swimming. Thanks to these very accurate data, we can study how the ocean affects the animal's behavior. Argos is the most widely spread transmitter system for animal tracking. This revolutionary technique was created in the 1970s. A transmitter placed on an animal sends a signal to a low Earth orbit satellite to provide data on behavior of the species. There are today in the world approximately 7,000 animals carrying Argos transmitters.
As the number of vessels at sea steadily rises to an average of 145,000 a day, 10 times more than five years ago, satellite monitoring is indispensable to ensure the safety of marine traffic. Data provided by satellites is also used to predict storms, to monitor iceberg drifts, to combat pollution, and to fight against piracy. Coastal states have implemented the LRIT regulation, which requires all freighters to carry a tracking device that enables their position to be monitored on sea routes. The use of radar satellites also helps to detect ships, or rather pinpoint ships that fail to abide by regulations and do not carry a satellite device. It also detects accidental or intentional ocean pollution. With the vessel's position and the radar satellite imagery, we can identify vessels violating regulations and polluters. In the specific case of piracy, ships are equipped with tracking devices which they can use to raise the alarm in case of attack and also enable a fast intervention as we know the vessel's location and the time of the attack. Satellite imaging can now provide farmers with information on their crops. Crop monitoring services, based on satellite imagery, provide guidance and recommendation maps for farmers. They can determine which areas require additional fertilizers, the amount required, and the optimal timing for application, as well as help prevent crop diseases. These and other issues can be managed through satellite farming services, such as FarmStar. These services benefit both the farmer, who optimizes his use of fertilizers, and the planet, thanks to controlling the use of soil amendments. It represents a small return to the Earth, which has given us so much already. We received the first map three weeks after sowing. After this, we receive a map every three weeks to follow crop development. This program has become so successful that developers have now created a service designed specifically for wine growers. We need to improve our production in low production areas and hillsides and to achieve better results in large areas of around 5,000 acres, we must use modern technology to assess rapidly the global condition of the vineyard. When we thought of drip irrigation, the satellite images helped us choose the right drippers, the right size drippers, and adjust the water flow to maintain the plant and optimize quality. We might think that this crowded suburb of the Earth is only there to facilitate life on our blue planet. This would be underestimating the long-standing curiosity of Earthlings. May 2009, Ariane 5 takes off again from the Kourou Space Center. It's carrying the Herschel satellite, whose mission will be to observe the skies from beyond the atmosphere. This gigantic space telescope is equipped with the largest mirror ever launched into space. Thanks to infrared vision, Herschel allows scientists to access the colder areas in outer space where stars are born. Operational satellites offer us amazing images from space and encourage scientists in their research for an ever better understanding of the universe, which may ultimately give us the key to the origin of life. You know, since Arthur Clarke's vision of satellite orbiting our planet, three generations of scientists and engineers have been driven by the same ambition, to push back even further the limits of human achievement. In fact, Clark was fascinated by the idea of connecting the next thing that is possible with the next thing that is impossible. I believe that space 
is still a world of passion and adventure.